Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Leslie Fontenot, and I am the Managing Director for Black Health Matters. Black Health Matters is a multi-channel communication company that uplifts Black families by providing tools, resources, and strategies to help them live their most healthiest life. You can learn more about us by visiting blackhealthmatters.com. This program tonight is made possible by our sponsor, Eli Lilly and Company. And I'd like to also extend a warm welcome and thank you to our community partners, Black Women Organized for Political Action, BOPA of California, Mothers in Action, the Black Women Collective, and For the Breast of Us. As you all know, today is the last day of Women's History Month. And as we continue on, we continue to make history every day. You are all in for a treat tonight. You will hear, you will be inspired by the testimonials of two phenomenal breast cancer survivors who are thriving and a breast surgical oncologist who's doing the work in our community. But before I introduce them here, let's cover some housekeeping items. First off, please share your questions in the chat. We'll have time for Q&A during this meeting. Also, please complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. It'll help us as we evaluate this program and also bring other programs to the community. And um, also, lastly, we have, and not least, we have a mammogram screening scheduled for here in the greater Los Angeles area. Our partners, BOPA, Mothers in Action, and Black Women Collective are co-hosting this free mammogram screening for uninsured women ages 40 plus at the LA Sentinel this Saturday from 8.30 to 5.00. Uh, the LA Sentinels located at 3800 Crenshaw Boulevard. So feel free to call. You'll see the number here on the flyer or um, you check blackhealthmatters.com or our Facebook page. You'll see the flyer in the, um, on our Facebook page and you can actually click on the link and, and um, register. Please share this with others in the community that have not taking advantage of having a mammogram or don't have insurance um, because we want to get as many people scheduled as possible and also have them have their mammogram. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. Uh, first up, we have Ebony Thompson. Ebony Thompson's a passionate author, speaker, and transformation mindset and business consultant and coach. She has self-published 11 of her own books, which have been sold across the country. Her most recent being her tell-all testimonial of the beginning stages of her battling stage four breast cancer entitled The Hustle Journey. Her collection of materials also includes poetry, inspirational devotions, and self-help workshops. Ebony is in the greater Los Angeles area, which is uh, where we're located now <laughs> with, and she's also with For the Breast of Us. She's a patient ambassador here. Uh, For the Breast of Us is a national organization whose mission is to empower women of color affected by breast cancer through education, advocacy, and in the community. Next, we'll have Dr. Cheryl Wissenhunt. Dr. Wissenhunt is a breast cancer survivor and community advocate. Professionally, she has practiced dentistry since 1995. Maybe I shouldn't give all those years out to everybody, right? <laughs> she is a graduate of Meharry Medical School, and she has been active in the community with her membership in Delta Sigma Theta, Jack and Jill of America, and the Lynx. Dr. Wisenhunt has served as a board member of Susan G. Komen Foundation and raced with her team, Bald and Beautiful, which was considered the largest and was the, one of the top teams for 10 years. That's phenomenal. And then we also have Dr. Veronica Jones. Dr. Veronica Jones is assistant professor of breast surgical oncology with City of Hope 
here in the greater Los Angeles area. Dr. Jones earned her undergraduate degree with honors from Stanford University before receiving her medical doctorate with honors from Meharry Medical College in Nashville. As a breast surgical oncologist, she is committed to conducting research on disparities in breast cancer treatment and outcomes. The focus of her research is investigating genetic drivers of aggressive breast cancer biology, especially among underrepresented minorities. She aims to develop drugs that work better than the current standard therapies in these populations. She also partners with universities in the surrounding area to develop devices that treat breast cancer in a minimally invasive way. She also holds active memberships with several professional societies and is heavily involved in community outreach, speaking frequent, frequently at numerous events across Southern California. And now let's hear from these fabulous women and community leaders. So I will pass the virtual mic that we have here over to Miss Ebony Thompson. Thank, Thank you. you, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie, so much. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Ebony. Um, Leslie did a phenomenal job with um, introducing me. I want to thank you all for um, welcoming me aboard and actually giving me the opportunity to speak. So in my case, just a little bit about my journey and my story is, you know, how they say, hey, when you're 40, go get a mammogram. When you're 40, go get a mammogram. Well, I was under the age of 40. I was one of those ones that was diagnosed under the age of 40. I was actually 37 years old. Um, I didn't have like the regular um, symptoms, as you would say. Um, I did have a lump at one time. And in my case, I was actually misdiagnosed. In 2015, I had went to the doctor because I felt a lump. I did the responsible thing. I went and got it checked out and actually got it checked out for a whole year. And the doctors told me, hey, you're fine. You're fine. You're doing wonderful. And so I went on about my business. Um, we're going to fast forward to um, late December, December the 28th to be exact. Um, I was at home with my children. Um, I'm a mom of four. Uh, we were cleaning up, getting rid of all the Christmas things. And I was having shortness of breath. And now some things that came about to where like throughout the summer, I would, couldn't walk the same distance. Um, I had went to the doctor. They had told me that it was adult onset asthma. I was like, oh, okay, my dad had it. Okay, maybe it's hereditary because nobody in my family has ever had any forms of breast cancer. I am the first. Um, Fast forward, um, I had went to the restroom and I could not catch my breath whatsoever. Um, when I had to clap my hands really loud and I, my daughter, my oldest daughter noticed that what I was doing and I told her, I have to get to the emergency room right now. We went to the emergency room. They thought I had RSV until the emergency on-call physician was like, we're gonna do one more, one more scan. We're gonna do one more check just to make sure. And that is when he found um, cancer and a lot of it. Um, by the time I found out, I was already at stage four, which for those who don't know what stage four is, that means it had spread to other parts of my body. Um, when they got, when we finally did the biopsy, that is, I, I found out why I couldn't breathe. <laughs> um, it had spread to um, my lungs. It was in 50% of both of my lungs. Um, it was on my bone. It was on my spine, as well as it was on the tip of my pancreas. Um, I was then um, walking around with oxygen. I had doctors um, at times tell me that to my face that I was not going to be here, that I was not going to make it. But I'm a fighter. <laughs> I always have been a fighter. And I'm the type of person that you tell me I can't, I'm going to show you I will. As well as I have super, super, super strength and faith. 
um, I knew that if I couldn't lean on anything or anybody, I knew that I could lean on God. And that is what I have went through. Um, I have been through, I'm still in it um, currently. Um, I am no longer on IV intravenous um, chemo. I do just take the pills. As you can see, I am not on oxygen, <laughs> praise God, uh, not on oxygen. Um, and then I um, just, because it is an extreme mental battle, I went and I was looking at different stuff on um, Facebook and Instagram. And this one lady who I actually connected with um, was just like, hey, check these people out. And I came across for the breast of us. And it was like being in a sisterhood of people that, because they knew what I was going through. You know, you always have those people that tell you, oh, oh, I know what you're going through. Oh, I can only imagine. And even if you could imagine, you really can't. Um, even when I talk to people who are going through breast cancer, I never say, I know what you're going through because we're all different. And so um, for the breast of us, they would have positive stuff up and they would be informative. That's how I found out different things that my insurance would pay for that I didn't know um, what they paid for. They gave me funny tips on how to wear wigs and um, I could reach out to those different people and different sisters to actually connect with and actually have them listen to my story. So when the opportunity actually came up to be a part and to be an ambassador, I said, this is my way of being able to give back to them while giving back to the community as well. I believe that um, it is part of my calling and my duty to be here to be a voice to people who may cannot or don't feel like speaking at the moment. And also being a voice for those who fought the, fought the battle and they're no longer here. So I'm picking up the baton and continuing to run. Um, with For the Breast of Us, <laughs> um, we have an awesome Facebook page, and that's where I connected with a lot of ladies, as well as they have a podcast that, I mean, they let it all hang out. <laughs> um, you, fight, you, you laugh, you cry, you do everything, um, and it's called Baddie to Baddie, um, and if you just put in any of the information, like when you go to podcast, put Baddie to Baddie, it'll pop straight up. And so it's very, very informative. Um, I'm glad I connected with them. And just being on this journey, it has been rough. Um, it has been, um, it has been tiresome. Um, there's times where I was just like, God help. But God, other than my uh, baddies is what we call each other. Other than them, God has surrounded me with some people of faith who are now like my family, who when I'm down, they lift me up. Um, I've been blessed with some amazing children who have helped me in every form and facet um, that you could possibly think of. So um, just in general, like I tell people, I'm always an advocate. Breast cancer awareness to me is not just in October. But it's all year round because you have a woman, maybe whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your coworker, or maybe it's yourself. We live with that every day. We live with it every day, whether you're still thriving through it or whether you're surviving it. And the best thing is early detection is always the best detection. Um, if I knew a lot of the early signs that I see now were signs other than the lump, I would have definitely got a second opinion. But hey, I'm here now and I'm believing God that he's going to heal me, that I'm already healed. I'm just walking out his process and I'm here and I'm here to stay and I'm walking forward and pushing forward and being a voice to those who can't talk at the moment. So that's my share. That's my story. I want to thank um, Black Health Matters. And all of you lovely ladies who are on here right now, thank you. Thank you so much, Ebony. And now we'll hear from Dr. Weisenhut. 
Hi. Um, thank you for inviting me. This is usually not the thing that I do. Um, I'm usually the person that's in the background, not the person that's in the forefront. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, so by 1999, I, I was married and I had been married for eight years to Kimmer. I had a seven-year-old daughter named Jillian, but I didn't know that it would also bring three major changes in my life. We bought a house in May. I gave birth to my son, Preston, after being told that I couldn't have any more children. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer in October. To be honest, I didn't do self checks for lumps or bumps, but I was the one who felt the first lump. I can remember distinctly carrying Preston upstairs and I kind of um, touched my chest for some reason. And I felt this hard lump. At first I just thought, well, maybe I just touched my sternum, um, but it got my attention and I casually mentioned it to my husband and we agreed that I would have to make an appointment with my OBGYN to take a look at it. My doctor, who I know well, referred me for a mammogram, then a needle biopsy, which led to a lumpectomy and then the results with the surgeon. Mm -hmm. My mother went with me to get the results just, and just in case he would tell me some bad news, I wanted my mother there. He said, and I quote, these results are terrible. I was actually doing okay with this process until he said that statement in that very blunt manner. Then I had thoughts that, um, you know, the big C that, you know, I'm not gonna make it, um, but what would happen to my kids without me? The surgeon said that my cancer was in clusters and that he recommended um, that I had a mastectomy because it, that kind of breast uh, clumps was spread to other, um, mm -hmm. the other breasts. So he referred me to oncologist, oncologist, and at first, the first one that I went to, I didn't like him. And so it seemed like he was only interested in my age, which was 39. And then I was referred to an oncologist that I liked immediately because he was more concerned about my condition than my age. And he wanted to treat my cancer aggressively with a mastectomy and chemo. I wanted the best chances that I could be given because of course I wanted to be around for a while. Um, I did want to get some things in order at that time. So after moving into this house, the family ahead of us had gotten a divorce. So I said, let's have the priest over, Chris and Preston, Chris in the home, you know, and bless the house. Um, my uh, initial diagnosis was introductal carcinoma. I had a mastectomy, a tram tram flap reconstruction mm -hmm. and um, the surgery took about eight hours and then they took about 18 lymph nodes out that were um, negative. Um, so the recovery and healing took, healing took about six months. I had five drains between the breast and the stomach surgical sites. I was so blessed to be nurtured by all of my family. My mother came over every day for about a year I need help taking care of myself. And remember, I had a newborn who needed my help too, and a small child too. Chemo started in December, 1999, but before the second dose, I, um, I noticed um, my hair was falling out on New Year's Eve. My sisters called me, they were going out shopping for the party that was gonna happen in my house. And I said, my hair is falling out. And they literally got to my house in five minutes. Um, during uh, the time that I was bald, I chose not to wear a wig. I sported my bald head. I had about four or five chemo treatments. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, I'm basically a quiet person who doesn't like to be in the limelight. I like to be in the background. And so I didn't share my diagnosis with hardly anybody outside of the family. I never liked the look that you get when you tell somebody that you have cancer and they look at you sad like it's the end of the world and it's not. So 2000, moved to 2003, my first follow-up for a six month follow-up. I had previously been on three month follow-ups up all, all the way up to then. Uh, doing my exam, my oncologist noticed an enlarged lymph nodes above my clavicle 
on my right side, which led to a PET scan, which led to a biopsy. And um, our friend who is also the OBGYN called me that night at my home to let me know that I was now diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. It had metastasized. Um, luckily, my cancer is HER2 negative, but estrogen positive. Um, so moving on to 2013, I was sitting at work at the computer. I see my reflection in the computer. And when I turn my neck, I notice a lump. I didn't worry about it for only a few seconds, of course. And I called one of my coworkers up and I said, hey, do you, do you see this? I moved my neck to the side and they're like, uh, what are you talking about? That lump on your neck, on your side of your neck? So I immediately ran out of the office, literally ran out of the office to my oncologist's office. And here we go again, PET scan. Diagnosis metastatic adenocarcinoma, a site. Since I've been doing so so good, and the Fomar course only Fomar course was only supposed to be temporary because we're almost with we're ten year, ten years out from the last recurrence, um, and I was temporarily off Fomar because I my hair was totally falling out. But this time I'm on for Fomar forever. Moving now to two, now, 2019, I'm in my six month follow up with a nurse practitioner. And they do labs every time you go to see the nurse practitioner or the doctor. And I usually just see the doctor, but we're at six months now. So, you know, we thought everything was okay. So she gives me a call. I'm driving down the street with my daughter in the car. It's about eight o'clock at night. And she says, um, your tumor markers are up. So when she told me that, here we go again, head scan. Um, and then when I went to my oncologist for the results, he had that same grim look on his face every time that I come back in his back. Um, he told me at that time that he had a lot of tricks in his bag, so if I would be okay, it would, if he needed to try something else besides uh, uh, pills. So I uh, continued with the medicine, which led to another follow-up in a few weeks to see if any shrinkage of the lymph nodes and it had, it had occurred. So now we're in 2022, my root, routine follow-up, PET scan again, my oncologist gave me that look again, but this time was even more alarming to me because it wasn't on my right side, it was on the other side. It was on my left side. Keep in mind that I am his miracle patient of 22 years who has been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2003. This time there was a large lymph nodes on the left side and a suspicious area on my liver. This led to a scan on my liver could it be that I'm really in trouble since metastasis on the left side? My oncologist gives me another grim look, but it subsided when I told him, you know what? I had um, my COVID test, my COVID vaccine done recently. And then uh, his expression changed because they, they had just recently found out that there had been a correlation with getting the COVID vaccine and people coming back with enlarged lymph nodes. But just in case, he did an ultrasound and then we had another follow-up follow ultrasound and woo, it was, wow, it was the vaccine. Okay, my last follow-up was February, 2022 and my PET scan was clear. This was the first time in 22 years that my oncologist told me that I was cancer-free. So as I said, I like to be the silent one in the background, but over the years, I have become more and more vocal about my disease, my experience with breast cancer. I formed a team with another survivor, Sharice, called The Bald and the Beautiful. And we have participated in the, the Susan Coleman race for 10 years. And as I said, we have the very fat last year, we won most survivors, most donations, and most members. But every year before that, we won, we won most survivors and most members. So also I um, served on the board of the Susan Coleman um, Foundation for a couple of years. Not sure, sure exactly what the exact dates were. But the advice I would give as a survivor would be release yourself of any negativity. And that includes 
people who are negative. Embrace your family, your friends, and embrace your faith. Gather good doctors who really care about their patients and follow doctor's orders. Don't miss any of your follow-up visits. My doctor used to tell me that breast cancer was a chronic illness. So treat it accordingly. Don't rush it. This is your health. It takes time to heal. Accept it. To just feel better and to even be yourself, take care of yourself. Pray, meditate, seek counseling, whatever you need to do to get through it. I have only one regret is that I was sick in those 22 years living with cancer. I missed some of the early years of my children's lives and then my marriage. When a family member is sick, it affects everyone in that circle. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Dr. Wisenhunt, Cheryl. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate, Wisenhunt, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your story and as well as the tips and advice. And so we now are passing the virtual mic over to Dr. Veronica Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to share my screen because I do have a presentation for everyone. Um, so give me a second. Um, can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Great. So, um, yeah, I'm Veronica Jones. I am a breast surgeon at City of Hope. And I'm just going to talk to everybody today a little bit about what breast cancer is and um, how to prevent it, how to catch it early. And before I start, I just want to um, say thank you to the survivors who have just shared, to Cheryl and Ebony. Um, I really appreciate your vulnerability. I appreciate your strength. And um, I'm just so proud of both of you. So um, thank you for sharing. And um, it, it just, it means a lot to hear your stories. Um, so with that, I will start. So I just wanna start with this, um, this proverb that an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And so I just want to acknowledge everybody on this call taking time out of their evening to learn about breast cancer and in doing so um, you're changing generations. So thank you so much for, for being here tonight. So just what is breast cancer? Uh, breast cancer is essentially cells that grow out of control in the breast and have the ability to go into other tissues. And that's just what cancer is in general. It's an overgrowth of cells that cannot be controlled by the typical ways our body keeps cells in the places where they started. And breast cancer can start in the, the places that make milk, or it can be in the um, the ducts that transport the milk, but it's not usually in the fat of the breast, right? So you have two parts of your breast. You have the fatty portion, and then you also have the part that makes milk. And the cancer comes from the parts that make milk and not kind of the, the fatty part of the breast. And I'll talk about why that's important in just a little bit when it comes to mammograms. So essentially your breast tissue is regulated or controlled by your hormones estrogen and progesterone. Your normal breast tissue is controlled by your hormones, which is why you see changes in your breast during puberty, during menstruation, pregnancy, when you're um, menopausal, because they are responding to your breast tissue so if, or responding to your hormones. So if you ever had breast pain or if you ever had, um, you know, oh, my, my breasts just ache during my cycle, it's because they're responding to those hormones. And a lot of things that we see in the breast are just responsive to hormones. So if you have cysts, for example, those cysts are just your breast swelling in response to estrogen that's flowing through your body. And that can happen um, even after menopause. 
So breast can cancer is extremely common. Unfortunately, um, there are lots of new cases. Fortunately, there are also um, more than three and a half million survivors. We are getting better at our treatment. We do still have a ways to go. Um, it will affect one in eight women in their lifetime, and it's 100 times more common in women. So I know you do hear about it in men, but typically it is um, a disease that women get. And then the rates, unfortunately, have been increasing in Black women. And so I just put this slide up here because um, I don't want to scare um, people in that breast cancer typically becomes more common as you get older. Of course, as we heard tonight, you can get it at a young age and that does happen, absolutely. Um, but for the most part, breast cancer becomes more common as um, you get older in age. And then unfortunately it does um, affect black women at a higher, uh, not necessarily at a higher rate, but the death rate is higher in black women. So. We, a lot of my research personally is looking at how to help this, how to decrease this disparity and how to make it so that the drugs that we have uh, work in black women just as well as they work in white women. And we are getting better. Again, a lot still needs to be done, but a lot has been done. And the rates of um, death from breast cancer are going down in all races. So that's just what this slide shows. So you might be wondering what actually causes breast cancer. And breast cancer is caused by changes in your DNA. So DNA is kind of like the computer part of your cell, right? Your DNA tells your body what proteins to make, when to make them, um, how to make them. But you can have changes in this DNA so that you don't make the proteins and your cells don't work as they um, are supposed to. And you can get these uh, changes in your DNA from your parents. So that's when you start thinking about, oh, was this breast cancer caused by somebody in my family, um, having a gene that caused breast cancer, or it can just happen because of certain lifestyle factors. And some of those we can affect, um, some of them we can't. So what are those things that increase the risk of breast cancer um, for all patients? Well, breast cancer is a disease that gets more common as you get older. Um, but besides that, it has to do with how much hormones your body sees over your lifetime, right? Because your breasts are responding to those hormones. Your hormones control your breasts. So if you have more estrogen exposure in your lifetime, then you actually have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. That's when you have your periods are starting early or you go into menopause late. Um, if you do not have a pregnancy or you take birth control pills for a long you know, extended period of time or take hormone treatment um, after you go into menopause, I'm not saying don't do any of these things. It's just that those can affect your risk of um, getting breast cancer. Also, um, the fat cells in our bodies make estrogen, and so that's why you see gaining weight or having diabetes as sometimes uh, being one of those uh, reasons that you can have an increased risk of breast cancer. And then there are just some other factors that you can't control, right? Like having dense breast tissue. You might have heard that when you got your last mammogram. That's something that you can't control, but it has to do with how many of those cells or how many of those milk ducts you have, because I said the breast cancer comes from those milk ducts. So if you have more of those milk ducts, that's what correlates as dense breast tissue on your mammogram. And that's why having dense breasts means that you are possibly at increased risk of developing breast cancer. And then some other things like um, some childhood cancers are treated with radiation. And so if you have radiation as a child, that can increase your risk of um, getting breast cancer. But it also has to do with your family history, right? And so you want to know who has cancer in your family, not just breast cancer, but all cancers. And you wanna know who had it, both sides, both mother and father side do count um, what type of breast cancer or what type of cancer they had, how old they were and how it was treated. Um, sometimes, even if you don't know all these details, if you know how they were treated, 
most of the time your doctor can figure out the other details just from what you're sharing. Um, they'll know more about the cancer than maybe your family member did. So definitely know what the, what the cancer history is in your family because your own family history can increase your risk of breast cancer. Now you might be saying, okay, that's great, but what is my risk? Like how, how, how can I know what my personal risk is? Well, it does depend on your family history. It depends on um, your own personal history, those factors that I was talking about that increase breast cancer. Um, but only five to 10% of breast cancers run through the family, right? So only 10% of women who have breast cancer have a family member with breast cancer. That means most of them are not genetic, but there are tests that you can do to predict your risk of getting breast cancer based on all of these factors, based on all of your family history and your personal history. So that's something that we're going to advocate for everybody um, on this call to know their own personal risk of getting breast cancer. You might be wondering, okay, but do I need genetic testing? Won't that just tell me my risk? Well, um, only 10% of breast cancers run in the genes. So you can get genetic testing and you should get genetic testing if cancer runs in your family. If someone had breast cancer at an early age, then they should get testing or everybody in their family can get testing. Um, if you had someone with aggressive breast cancer, one of the aggressive types, they can get testing or their family member should get testing or any family history of ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, or a man with breast cancer. Those are automatic qualifications to get genetic testing. So even if say your grandfather had breast cancer, you would qualify for genetic testing because it can be in a first, second, or third degree relative. So if your aunt, your great aunt had pancreatic cancer, then you qualify for genetic testing. And it's because those cancers are thought to be linked, um, being ovarian, pancreatic, male breast cancer. Um, and so you, you definitely qualify. Um, what happens in genetic counseling is they'll just talk to you about your family history and they'll review um, if any genes are more likely to be causing um, a cancer or, or likely to cause a cancer in your family. And then they'll talk about your results. They'll do a blood test though in you know, the past couple of years with COVID, we've been doing at-home saliva kits. So we've been mailing them to people. They just do it at home and send it in and we're able to do a virtual consultation um, over the genetic results. So like I said, only 10% of these though, of the breast cancers are associated with genes. And so it's important to have a risk assessment which can done, be done even if you don't have a gene for breast cancer. You can have, there's these computer tools that can tell you your risk of getting breast cancer. Um, and your physician should know, you know about these tools, but if they don't, um, unfortunately, you know, we, a lot of times we have to advocate for ourselves with um, providers. And so you just ask your physician for a referral to a breast surgeon, an OB, someone who knows how to do these risk calculators, a um, geneticist, someone should be able to do it for you. So once you know your risk of developing breast cancer, you might be wondering what are the next steps I should take? And the first one is definitely to try to decrease that risk. And the second one is to know what screening you need to catch something early. Um, I think it was Ebony who shared that, that early detection is key and that is so important. Um, know what screening you need and I'll go over that in just a second. So you can, de there are things you can do to decrease the risk and there are things that you can do to catch something early just to try to um, treat it right away. So decreasing your risk starts right with knowing your risk. So I can't stress that enough. Know your risk of developing breast cancer, even if it doesn't run in your family. You can get those computer tools to figure it out. Um, stay up to date with your screening, but then you can also um, live a healthy, active lifestyle. We recommend 30 minutes of exercise a day, five days a week, or 75 minutes of high intensity exercise weekly. Um, so 15 minutes of really high impact exercise five days a week or 30 minutes of just kind of moderate walking uh, five days a week for 30 minutes each day. But then depending on how 
high your risk is, there are other things you can do. Sometimes you can take medicines uh, like tamoxifen. You might've heard that in breast cancer treatment, but you can also take it to help lower your risk of breast cancer. And then if you really do have a high risk, which is considered anything over 20, 25% risk of getting breast cancer, you can do surgery. Now I'm a surgeon. This is part of what I do um, is to remove breast tissue to try to decrease the risk of getting breast cancer. And this is pretty effective. It will reduce your risk by about 90 to 98%. So if you are at high risk, that is an option for you. Um, but what screening should you have? So starting at age 25, you should have a formal risk assessment. What that means is have a very candid conversation with your primary care doctor, your OB, your family physician, someone you trust and ask them to tell you, what is my risk of getting cancer? Because they owe that to you, <laughs> quite frankly. They, they, should, they should be able to know what your risk of is, is getting um, cancer, any type of cancer. And based on that, they should recommend screening for you. The start of mammograms um, at age 40 is for average risk women. That's not for women who are at higher risk. And so it's important for you to know by age 25 what your risk is, because you may need other imaging. Mammograms are not great when you have dense breast tissue. And there's no age cutoff for getting mammograms, by the way. You start at age 40 if you're average risk, but there's no end date. I've had patients um, come to me, unfortunately, with breast cancer, you know, diagnosed when they were 80 years old. And they said, oh, my doctor said I didn't need you know, mammograms after I turned 70. That's not true. Um, you get mammograms as long as you would want treatment for a breast cancer. Um, and, but then if you're high risk for breast cancer, you can have MRIs starting at age 25 and mammograms actually starting at age 30, just to be able to catch it as early as possible. And then once, if you have a really strong family history, you'll alternate, you'll get mammograms and MRIs kind of every six months. That sounds like a lot. And so I wanted to go over just briefly what these tests are and how much radiation is actually in them. So for a mammogram, the radiation dose per mammogram is less than an airplane trip across the country, a one way. So it's, it's actually a low amount of radiation. It's not, amount of, not enough radiation to cause damage to your cells or your skin. It's not enough radiation to cause a breast cancer. And when you have the mammogram, typically they'll do three different views, unless you have implants, then you need six. So they'll do three different views, kind of up and down, side to side, and then at a diagonal. And that's really just to press through the tissue to be able to see it at different angles to look for a lump. Now a lump shows up as bright white on a mammogram, but dense breast tissue also shows up as bright white. And I have a picture at the bottom. So that's why if you live in the state of California and you have a mammogram, they say, oh, you have dense breast tissue, it may obscure a mass. That's what it says. And what really it's saying is when you have dense breast tissue that shows up as white and your regular tissue shows up as white. So we can't really see through your tissue to see if there's a mass there. I say all this to say, if you feel a mass, this, the actual test that you should get is an ultrasound and not a mammogram. If you feel a mass and the mammogram looks fine, then great, but don't stop there. Go ahead and get an ultrasound because that will be better, especially in, in younger people to be able to see um, a lump. You also might've heard about, you know, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about, well, are mammograms even good and, you know, nobody can agree on when you start them, 40, 50. So yeah, there are a lot of recommendations out there, but the most widely accepted one, um, the one put out by the American Society of Breast Surgeons and American College of Radi Radiology say that you start at age 40 and you continue them every year. Um, some patients are told that they only need them every two years. Definitely know your risk before you drop down to every two years. But for the most part, you're not going to be wrong if you start at age 40 and get them every year. So like I said, um, 
say you have a mass and the mammogram is okay, definitely get an ultrasound. Ultrasound can be done at any age. So while mammograms aren't really great until you're age 40, ultrasounds can be done at any age and they can be done when you're pregnant or when you're nursing. Um, and they're the best actually to detect a lump. You might say, well, why don't I just get ultrasounds? Why do I need the mammograms? Mammograms are actually good for something else that we look for called calcifications and calcium deposits can be an early sign of breast cancer, which is why you still need the mammogram, even though the ultrasounds are better for lumps. Um, ultrasounds are also good for lymph nodes, and I use them quite frequently in my practice if a patient has dense breast tissue. And I use it just to look, and, you know, take another look at the breast tissue. So I use physical exam, mammogram, and ultrasound quite frequently, just because it gives me that third um, look at the breast tissue. Also, if you have pain, um, you will hear that, oh, pain's not a sign of breast cancer. It absolutely is. And so if you have pain and you go to your physician and they say, oh, but your mammogram looks clear, ask for an ultrasound. It may be that it's a cyst, lots of cysts hurt, but an ultrasound be, will be the test that you use to be able to catch that. And then lastly, an MRI is a really sensitive test that we use. We typically use it if someone has cancer or if someone is at really high risk, but you can also get it if say you, have, you know something's different with your body, you, you feel it and the mammogram looks okay, then you can get an MRI just to be extremely sure that there's nothing going on that maybe the mammogram has missed. And also we get it quite frequently when you've been diagnosed with cancer because it can help guide our treatment. Um, so that's how to screen for a breast cancer. That's how you can lower your risk for breast cancer. But what if you're diagnosed with breast cancer? Um, a lot of breast cancers are curable. I mean, you can get to that place where your physician does say to you, that they don't see any evidence of cancer anymore. Um, even regardless of that, all breast cancers are treatable. So there are medicines that we give, there are therapies that we can do to decrease the cancer, to take away the symptoms. So definitely I'm advocating for everybody to um, seek treatment if you are diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, the therapy can include surgery, which is what I do, radiation, chemotherapy, anti-hormone pills, immunotherapy. We have a lot of therapies that we give and we're expanding that every day. Um, I also am a big advocate for second opinions. So if you do notice something with your body in general that you think is different, um, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of just getting a second opinion. I even tell my own patients who you know, meet with me to get a second opinion because if anything, it will just... Um, give them another perspective and also, you know, give them more confidence in the treatment that I'm recommending if they can hear someone else who even aligns with it. So um, I'm all about second opinions. And then something else that I want to stress is ask about clinical trials. Um, part of the reason we have this mortality difference is because the earliest, um, you know, clinical studies and research studies did not include black women. And so the drugs that were developed don't work as well in black women, or they cause some other side effect that wasn't seen in white women. So um, if there is a clinical trial, I encourage you to participate. I know there's a lot of um, historical, you know, baggage, not say it lightly, there with clinical research and studies. But Right now, I think mean, <laughs> clinical trials are what will help us advance in terms of getting treatments that work for everybody. Um, so in summary, I just wanna say, you know, know your body, know your family history, and importantly, know your risk because that will affect what you can do to decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. And also it'll help you know what screening that you need, how early you have to start and what you should have. Um, encourage your family and friends to do the same, you know your family history, talk to your family members. If you qualify for genetic testing, if your family members um, qualify for genetic testing, go ahead and get that done. Definitely find a doctor that you um, trust. I think it was um, Dr. Wisenhunt uh, that said that she went to another doctor and that's fantastic 
definitely go to a doctor that you feel like you can go to and be honest um, about the treatments, how they're affecting you and what your hopes are. And then if there are clinical trials available, definitely participate. So I think that's it. And we're going to go with the Q&A. Yes, I see we have a couple of questions in here and we have a little time um, to answer some of them here. So the first question for you, this is for Dr. Jones. Why, what's the difference when they ask about maternal versus paternal history of cancer? Yeah, that's um, mostly to see if the cancers are all on one side or if it's split between the maternal and paternal side. But breast cancer can run through the paternal side. So, you know, some people used to say, oh, it doesn't matter because it's on my father's side. That's not, that's not true because um, it can come through the father's side just as much as it can come through the mother's side. But when they're asking, they're, they're just trying to see patterns. You know, so if you, oh, I have two cousins with breast cancer, they want to know, okay, well, were they both on the maternal side? Because that's different than if one was maternal and one was paternal. Great. So we have another question here. Mm -hmm. um, you see the second one here? Yes, yes. Can you please go over some risk factors for breast cancer mortality in Black women? Um, yeah, for for breast cancer mortality. So, so the difference in mortality is um, really complex. There are lots of things that affect that difference in mortality that we see. And a lot of research is going on about okay, what environmental factors can we control? What personal factors can we control? And so um, I really just advocate for my patients to one, live as healthy a lifestyle as possible when you're diagnosed with breast cancer. One huge modifiable risk is weight management. Now this is especially hard um, when diagnosed with breast cancer because the treatment that we give makes it much harder for someone to maintain their weight, right? Like it's, it's much easier to gain weight when you're on breast cancer treatment. But we do know that if you're able to manage your weight, you reduce your risk of breast cancer, breast cancer coming back by about 40%, like four zero. So maintaining your weight with that healthy um, diet and also um, exercise is one of the biggest modifiable risk factors um, that kind of affects the, the mortality from, from breast cancer. Other than that, um, for mortality, once you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, there's not much modifiable except, I think it was Cheryl who said, you know, stay up to date with your appointments, catch something early, um, you know, take the medications, be honest with your doctor about if you hate the medications, because um, the, they can often switch you to something else that works better. So I would say honest communication and then living that healthy lifestyle as much as possible, even though it's hard. And That's then yeah. I see the last question here is, is there increased um, risk of breast cancer associated with assisted reproductive procedures like IVF? That is a great question. The answer is um, no. It, it is fine to have IVF. Now I know I talked about estrogen, you are exposing yourself to kind of these increased um, hormone levels, but the research actually has shown that it's safe to have IVF. Even my breast cancer patients, because I have a, a lot of young breast cancer patients, um, before they start treatment, we can get them in to see a reproductive um, endocrinologist or a reproductive uh, physician quickly have IVF or, or not IVF, but um, harvest their eggs and then start their treatment. So then they freeze their eggs and then they come back and have IVF after treatment because treatment can affect your fertility. So even those patients are getting um, harvesting of eggs and IVF after their treatment. And so it, it is safe to do that. Um, how do I request a biopsy? Okay. So if you have an area of concern on the MRI, um, a lot of times an MRI, like the radiologist will say, they'll give it a category, right? And it goes like zero through six. Those are the different categories. 
anything like three, four, definitely five, you can go ahead and get a biopsy. If the radiologist says, oh, this is nothing, but you're particularly concerned about it, I would talk to your physician about it. I've definitely, um, I talk to my patients and I, I, you know, they know their bodies better than I do, obviously. And so sometimes the radiologists have said, everything looks okay. And the patient says, no, like, I know, I know this is different. Talk to your doctor. They can order the biopsy, even if the radiologist doesn't formally recommend it on the report. Um, how long is too long to take hormone replacement therapy? Um, you know, there's no cutoff in terms of years to take hormone replacement therapy. I would say to um, periodically, maybe every couple years or so, um, come off of it and see if your symptoms are okay or lessen it. Or maybe if you're taking a pill form and your main you know, issue is vaginal dryness, try to switch to the suppositories or cream, somehow get off of the pill replacement therapy or the patch and maybe go to something local like a cream because even that will uh, be better for you than, than something else. Um, what about using birth control? Are there any with less impact? Implant, yeah, pills, IUD. That is, that is a fantastic question. They are not on the same level and it has to do with how much of the hormone is absorbed into your bloodstream. So um, an IUD has less that is absorbed into your bloodstream than say the pills. Um, the pill and the implant are, are a little bit more comparable, but the IUD because it's local is less. Um, and so that's actually has a much lower hormone level and is um, if, you know, for appropriate patients, right, an IUD is not right for everybody, but it can, it can be right, you know, if you're really worried about your breast cancer risk. And if you really have a really high risk of breast cancer, then you might want to think about a copper IUD because it, you know, it's, there's no hormones. Um, okay. That's and it. I, I just want to tell you, thanks everyone that have been on this program tonight. Thank you all for um, staying on and um, listening intently. I wanna thank our breast cancer survivors and ambassadors and champions for sharing their story. It was so inspirational. Thank you, Ebony, and thank you, Dr. Wisenhunt. I mean, it is incredible um, hearing your stories. And also, I know there's a question in here about tips for staying optimistic and strong. And we talked about that, they talked about it a little bit, but actually um, Miss Ebony Thompson is right here in the greater LA area for those that are viewing from LA. And um, she can actually um, provide some of that um, help and resource for you because she is with For the Breast of Us. I think we have the, um, we did put the website in the chat. And if you have a contact, maybe, um, Ebony, you might want to share that as well um, in the chat, um, but they may be able to, can they find you on the website? Yes, they'll be able to um, find me on the website, as well as I'll put my personal contact information, um, because I'll be more than glad to uh, <laughs> give all the tips and tricks that I've done, because I've done a lot. <laughs> And, and I also want to thank you. Oh my gosh, it was so informative as well as engaging Dr. Jones. I, you know, I was listening to your talk and I was like, wow, there's a lot of things I hadn't heard before. Or maybe it's just the way that you break down the information where it's like in uh, snackable bites really, so that we can really understand what's going on with our body. So I um, want to encourage everyone to stay strong to be diligent about your own health. Uh, we have another program coming up uh, April 28th for uh, breast cancer. It's gonna be held in Houston. Um, we do these in individual markets. We also have national programs as well. You'll learn more by visiting blackhealthmatters.com. You can also subscribe to our newsletter there where you'll be able to uh, learn more about programs we're doing across the country. And I want to thank you all. We're right at time and um, bid you good night and hope you have a nice evening. And make sure that you share our information about the mammogram screening this Saturday at the LA Sentinel.
from 8.30 to 5. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.